We're looking today at Acts chapter 4. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 4. It'll be on the screen with you in a moment. And as you're turning there, Acts chapter 4 is a chapter where the heat gets turned up a little bit, where people are starting to notice what's going on in that early church. Potential riots are breaking out. Things are happening. And I came across this line this week, N.T. Wright was relating the experience of a bishop from antiquity talking about his experience in ministry, and he says, everywhere St. Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere I go, they serve tea. You can imagine that his experience in ministry didn't feel quite the same as those early apostles. I want to start something that goes somewhere, and all people want to do is serve tea. And today, we're going to explore a passage where the religious leaders know that they are on the edge of a riot breaking out, and we'll observe what they do with that. So, Acts chapter 4, verses 1 and 2 begin this way. While Peter and John were speaking to the people, they were confronted by the priests, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus, there is resurrection of the dead. Remember the passage we looked at last week, the healing of the man who was crippled, and we're picking up right where we left off. Peter saw a moment to begin making theological application of what had just happened, and that got the Sadducees' ears beginning to perk up. And notice, these religious leaders are not upset about the healing, they're upset about the teaching. This group of religious leaders were aristocrats in their own right. They had personally funded a lot of the temple project, and they had earned their power and authority through the wealth that they had come to accumulate. Their pockets were deep, and their influence was broad. And they also did not believe in the resurrection from the dead. But Peter's main point in his sermon, the big idea that he was trying to get across and will continue to get across today is this. You killed him, but God raised him. He points the finger at the Jewish leaders and at the Jewish people and say, you put him to death, but God raised him. Remember, we read last week in Acts chapter 3, verse 15, you killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. And we are witnesses of this fact. He keeps preaching, verses 19 and on. Now, repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. Then times of refreshment will come from the presence of the Lord, and he will again send you Jesus, your appointed Messiah. For he must remain in heaven until the time for the final restoration of all things, as God promised long ago through his holy prophets. When God raised up his servant Jesus, he sent him first to you people of Israel to bless you by turning each of you back from your sinful ways. Peter's main thrust towards this group of religious leaders is that everything that you believe in, the system that you have helped establish, is about to be turned over. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Something new is happening. And this calls into question the authority that the religious leaders had. Did they actually have say in what happened? Did they actually have authority to carry out the business of the Israelite people and the religion of the Jews. The very fact that God raised Jesus from the dead flew in the face of the authority that the Sadducees claimed that they had. And so they act against Peter and John. In verse 3, the story continues. They arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. We're just going to hold them in a cell overnight. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of men who believed now totaled about 5,000. We've been looking at church growth in the book of Acts through multiplication. We began with 12 disciples who were gathered together with 120 others in the upper room. And then on the day of Pentecost, God himself, Jesus Christ, brought 3,000 people to their number. And now we read again of the number is growing up to 5,000 men. 
Likely a whole group of other women and children are a part of that number as well. But I think Luke interjects this into the stream of the story. He pauses for a moment and says, time out. You think that the gospel is being hindered because these men have been put into prison. Not at all. The carrier of the message may be in chains or in prison, but the gospel will never be in chains or in prison. In fact, the gospel somehow in some way has more power because someone is in chains than it would otherwise. You see, attempts to silence the gospel only make it louder and more potent. Persecution has been one of the greatest things that has ever happened to the church. Now, please don't run out from here today and set yourself up for undue persecution. Persecution is not fun. It is not something that you want to be a part of, but you bet every time the enemy attempts to tamper with the people of God, God will use it for his good. What the enemy meant for evil, God will turn for good. Though they are imprisoned, the gospel is proclaimed even louder and even stronger. Verse 5 through 7 continue. The next day, the council of all the rulers and leaders of the teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there along with Caiaphas. Do you recognize those names? Two individuals keenly a part of Jesus' unfair and unjust trial that had happened not a month and a half before. And also John and Alexander were there and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples, that's Peter and John, and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? This story is a battle for authority. Who has the final say? And Annas and Caiaphas and the rest of the religious leaders are really asking this question. Who gave you permission? Who signed the contract? Under what name are you performing these signs and these wonders? Because we didn't write off on it. You didn't ask us if you could do this. Whose power or authority have you done this under? Who gave you permission? Then Peter, in verse 8, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that he is healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Peter doesn't hold back. You'd think in this moment, if it were me, would I be this bold? Would I stick to my guns knowing that I was under the inquisition and the peering eye and the questioning? No, but Peter boldly under the power of the Holy Spirit articulates the gospel once again to these religious leaders. The name of Jesus Christ is the name by which we healed this man. And by the way, you killed him, but God raised him from the dead. Just thought I'd slip that in there once more. And he continues, for Jesus is the one referenced in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. You rejected Jesus, but he has now become the stone upon which every other stone of the kingdom of God will be oriented and placed. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There is no other name. Peter moves expertly from the example of the man healed in the body to the ultimate restoration that Jesus wants to bring about for whole human beings in salvation. God can heal not just the body, but he can also save the soul. And there is no other authority that can save. The church cannot save you. Your politicians cannot save you. Cable news cannot save you. Your social media feed cannot save you. The money that you have cannot save you. 
The position that you hold, the job that you do cannot save you. There is only one name that brings salvation and that name is Jesus Christ. And in the world that we live in today, this being an election year, okay? We've got a, a few months, but it's starting to pick up. The President of the United States will not save you. It's our duty to vote, absolutely. But if you hang your life on what happens on Capitol Hill, then you have, you've picked the wrong authority. There is no other name in heaven or on earth that can save you but Jesus Christ himself. And that salvation is for your whole person, body, soul, and mind. John Mark Comer in his book, Practicing the Way, page 95, says, salvation is not just about getting back on the right side of God's mercy through judicial acquittal. It's about having your soul healed by God's loving touch. Ironically, the same sin that keeps us from relationship with God can be healed only by God. Yet again, we need to be saved. And Peter points to the man who was crippled from birth and says he is an illustration and an example of what God wants to do for everyone. That is the process of salvation. The story continues in verse 13. It says the members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John for they could see, they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. Notice, they look at Peter and John and they see their boldness and they compare that to their schooling. These guys had not gone to Andrew's Theological Seminary or got a degree in theology from Southwestern Adventist University. They were untrained in the scriptures and it says that they were ordinary men. The original Greek word from which we get ordinary in Greek is idiotai. You don't need a theology degree to make the connection about what ordinary means in this context. They say, this isn't lining up. The boldness by which you're preaching is not lining up by your schooling, but wait, you've been with Jesus. That made all the difference for the disciples. And Perhaps, you know, we were talking a couple sermons ago about renaming Acts. I think by this chapter, perhaps the renaming of Acts would be this. Acts, what happened to Peter? <laughs> you remember him from the Gospels, right? This guy that is boldly preaching in the name of Jesus was the same guy aiming for Malchus's head. He wasn't aiming for his ear, okay? Peter, the, the one who would speak before he thought, the, the loudmouth, the one who denied Jesus, the chicken. And it wasn't just Peter that was changed. All of the disciples had been changed. And the difference, they had been with Jesus. Amen. They had been with Jesus. And before this council, they had been with Jesus enough that the council recognized you. And it scared the council because they thought they had done away with Jesus by killing him. But now Jesus is looking them in the face again through his disciples. There are many things in this world that when we participate in, people realize that we've participated in it, right? If you've been out in the sun too long, everybody knows you've been out in the sun too long, right? And maybe you go swimming, people know that you've gone swimming. If you've been in Texas long enough, you know that you'll be a Texan, right, y'all? It begins to, begins to rub off. Whenever you're around a campfire, people know that you've been around a campfire. Sometimes I'll go, you know, do Vespers or go into somebody's house and have a nice little fire, or come home afterwards, and Melissa says, no, laundry room, clothes are going there, you're going in the shower, you smell like fire, you smell like smoke, right? Uh, and maybe, you know, when you've been to a subway, everybody else knows that, you know, I'm just gonna, we'll leave that one there. John Mark Comer again, his book, Practicing the Way, page 87. Church attendance, good sermons, and regular Bible study by themselves have a very poor track record of yielding a high level of transformation in large numbers of people. It's far easier to go to church once a week, chasing a spiritual high and angle for a download from heaven than to do the daily unglamorous work of discipleship, AKA being with Jesus. Jesus is in the business of healing souls. But while the four gospels have dozens of stories of Jesus instantly healing people's bodies, after which, by the way, he almost always gave them instructions to go and do something as a next step. 
He doesn't seem to do the same with people's characters. There's not a single instance in which he simply waved his hand to take away an ugly habit or a personality trait in one of his apprentices. The opposite is true. We see their stubborn sinfulness live on for years. Jesus didn't zap them. He just kept teaching, rebuking, and loving them, giving them time to grow and mature. What happened with Peter? He spent time with Jesus. And when he should have gotten fired from being a disciple with Jesus, Jesus calling him into the office and saying, Peter, I just don't think this is going to work out. I think it's time for you to consider a different career path. Maybe fishing was for you. No, Jesus lovingly and patiently walked with Peter. And Peter's life is, a, is an example of transformation. Was Peter perfect by Acts chapter 4? By all means, no. He gets called out later in Paul's writings when he accuses Peter of being prejudiced and not eating lunch with the Gentiles. But all the way, Peter's character, his heart, and his mind are being transformed. Why? Because he's been with Jesus. And one of those moments in the Gospels where it was so clear that the disciples understood, maybe even just for a moment of Jesus' calling, was on the Mount of Transfiguration. We find it in Matthew chapter 17. And it says that at the end of that, verse, Matthew chapter 17, verse 8, when they looked up, Moses and Elijah, who had come to edify Jesus and strengthen him, were gone. And they saw who? Jesus only. Jesus only, Ellen White writes in Acts of the Apostles, page 64. In these words is contained the secret of the life and power that marked the history of the early church. When the disciples first heard the words of Christ, they felt their need of him. They sought him. They, found, they, sought, they, they sought, they found, they followed him. They were with him in the temple, at the table, on the mountainside, and in the field. They were as pupils with a teacher, daily receiving from his lessons of eternal truth. Their union with him was stronger now than when he was with them in person. The light and love and power of an indwelling Christ shone out through them so that men beholding marveled. Can people recognize in your life that you've been with Jesus? Do they stop you at the grocery store or in your place of work and ask you if you've been with Jesus. Jesus' discipleship model was not new. In fact, he co-opted the practice of the time. And when a rabbi would want to teach people, he would go and call students to follow him. And he didn't invite them into the classroom of the modern day. No, he invited them into 24-7 life with him. The rabbi ate lunch, the students ate lunch. The rabbi fasted, the students fasted. The rabbi stood up. The students stood up. The rabbi sat down. The students sat down. They followed their rabbi wherever he went. And along the way, he would impart to them truths. And he would teach them. And then one day, he would recognize in them that they had become like him. And they were ready to go make other disciples. Jesus, before the ascension in Matthew 28, when he says, go make disciples, baptize them, teach them, nothing new. It's what was done all along. What Jesus does is he reclaims that practice for gospel purpose. So the question for us is, are we students following in the way of Jesus? Are we apprentices to him that wherever Jesus goes, we will be found in his coattails? You see, the disciples before that group of elders and religious leaders that day, they recognized that they were with Jesus because the disciples were covered in the dust of the rabbi. They had been walking with him everywhere that he had gone. Are we today covered in the dust of our rabbi? And one way to answer that is to think about this question. Am I living life writing my resume or am I living life writing my eulogy? Am I thinking about success? What will bring me fame and credit now, padding my resume to make sure it looks good? Or am I 
walking in the Spirit so that when I die, I don't even know what people say about me, but I hope it's that I've left a positive impact in this world. If you live your life chasing your resume, your resume will never save you. But if you follow in the way of Jesus and begin to implement the practices that he has for you, when someone stands up and speaks at your funeral or memorial service, I hope and pray that in those good words is this line, they have been with Jesus. The story continues, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 4, verse 14. Since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, may I present to you exhibit A, the only exhibit for today. There was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council and conferred among themselves. They went into executive session. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny that they've performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name. They get their heads together and the best plan that they have is we're going to give them a stern talking to and that's going to be that. They called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? Okay, okay, so t- tell me this. You're sitting in judgment right now. You, you be the judge. Are we following God or are we following you? We really need to know that. We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. We have a testimony and a story that must be shared and you will not stop us. You cannot hold us back. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. They were just hoping that tea would be served, right? For everyone is praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. And as soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. And when they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. I love this vision of the early church community that when confronted with persecution, confronted with trials and tribulations, they come together raising their voices in prayer to God. They unite together as one, praying, God, praying to God, and they address God in this way. O oh, sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant. And we'll get to what David says in a moment. But I want to highlight what the early church believed about who God was. They saw God as creator of everything, revealer by the Holy Spirit, and participant in generations. We just read it. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth and everything in them, you spoke a revelation by the power of the Holy Spirit, and you grounded that, that, that revelation in history, inside generations. And they recognized that God had been God from creation and that God had begun to speak about his character and about the plan of salvation since long ago. And God did not leave this earth on its own to just kind of spin towards entropy and see how things end up. No, God is actively participating in history as we speak. And that grounding takes them back to the psalmist David, and they're quoting from Psalm 2 in this passage. Psalm 2 is all about the world's response to the Messiah. Psalm 1 is all about our personal response to Messiah. Psalm 2 is the world's response. And David, God's servant, says this, Acts chapter 4, verse 25. Why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers of the earth gathered together against the Lord and his Messiah. And the apostles recognized this is not uncharted territory. We've seen this before. In fact, verse 27, this has happened here in this very city. 
For Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, and the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant, whom you appointed. We've had history. David said it was coming, and we've seen it already in our lifetime. No wonder the religious leaders are upset. But everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. In verse 28 and 29, continue on. And now, O Lord, hear their threats. Give us your servants great give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. They ask for three things. They ask that God would hear the threats. They ask that God would continue to give them boldness in preaching and that they would continue to heal under the name of Jesus. Three simple requests. Sometimes in our trials and our tribulations, it's enough to know that someone hears you. Amen? That you have someone that they don't have to fix your problem right then, but they can at least hear the bad things that someone has said about you or the difficult situation that you're in. And they ask, secondly, that boldness would continue to come from the throne of God that they would proclaim loudly and with clarity the gospel of Jesus Christ and that signs and wonders would continue to take place, that there would be healing in the name of Jesus. And after this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. The key to this whole story, what happened to Peter? He was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives boldness. When they stood before the council, likely wondering what in the world they were going to say, as they took a breath in, an outpouring of the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they proclaimed boldly, you killed him, but God raised him and we're not gonna stop talking about it. And they would continue on from this moment with the infilling of the Holy Spirit, proclaiming with boldness that Jesus is King, he's died to save, and salvation is accessible to everyone. So I think the apostles realized in all of this that boldness is less knowing something and more being with someone. Their knowledge and training didn't matter. It was who they trained with. It was who they were filled with. And to illustrate this, I'd like to share a story with you I came across this week. A nondescript third or fourth grade class and teacher is giving a lesson and it's on geography. And he's teaching this class about Australia. And he begins to ask the students about what people do in Australia. And many of the students raise their hand and they kind of share some of the stereotypical or caricature kind of things that we might think about what people do in Australia. And one student raised their hand and says, they go snorkeling in the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, Another one says, oh, they hang out with kangaroos all the time. Uh, Another one says, you know, just kind of all these kind of off the wall answers. And the the teacher's trying to steer and to direct the conversation and help the students grasp what another country and culture is like. So finally, everyone settles down and one girl kind of towards the back raises her hand with confidence and says, Teacher, I know what people do in Australia. The primary economic driver are farmers. They herd cattle and sheep. And agriculture is one of the main parts of the economy in Australia. And this third or fourth grader just begins to go on about the the GDP of Australia and how the economics go together and work. And the the teacher, he's, he's kind of put back a little bit. And he begins to, begins to ask her a question. How do you know all of this? Did you read ahead in the textbook? And she says, no, my dad's a farmer in Australia. We just moved to the States last year. I know about this because I've experienced it. And the same is true for our walk with Jesus. The reason that we can tell other people about love is because we've been loved by love ourselves. 
that we've experienced Jesus. You see, our father is a lover and our brother, his son, Jesus, is a savior and a redeemer. May we boldly proclaim the truth that though once Jesus was dead, he was raised to life again and he will reign eternally. And may we join the chorus of early believers, knowing that boldness is less knowing something and more about being with someone. Thanks for stopping by. I hope and pray that this message was a blessing for you. If you'd like to see more content like this, we need your help. You can support the Keene Seventh Adventist Church media ministry by going to AdventistGiving.org, finding the Keene Seventh Adventist Church in Texas, and then putting in your donation to the media line. Your faithful giving and support allows us to spread the gospel online for you and others to participate in. Thank you for your continued support of the Keene Seventh Adventist Church.